cool. So um, as was briefly mentioned, we're gonna talk about C++ and Rust today. Um, so just so you all know who I am, um, I'm Issy Muerte. And um, I'm a C++ Bruja. I do a lot of dark magic stuff with C++. If you know me personally, then you know that I do some really cursed things. Um, I'm an aspirant Rustation, so I do do a bit of Rust on the side. Not my day job. Also, don't really contribute to a lot of projects just because I'm busy, because uh, as of lately, I've become a bit of a CMake war criminal. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, I do some really disgusting things in CMake as of late. You could also make the argument that I'm not a C++ programmer anymore. I'm a CMake programmer that just happens to know C++. <laughs> C++. Um, I promise not to talk about CMake today. Um, I did that at the, uh, RustConf last year, and at one point someone just kind of walked away a little, little like depersonalized, disassociating, like I just wish I didn't know any of what you just told me. Um, uh, and then uh, Michael made this uh, tweet the other day. Uh, it's been zero days since I had a truly cursed idea, and that's a pretty accurate representation. Um, I care a lot about developer workflows, uh, build tools, um, making it so that you have to type less at your computer, because the more we type, the high, higher chance of having arthritis as we get older <laughs> increases. Um, I also currently hold the record for most papers submitted to a single C++ standards meeting. Um, <laughs> that was completely by accident. My name was on 20 papers. I don't think anyone's going to break that anytime soon. Um, so just, just to give you an idea that I do care about C++ a little bit. Um, I started teaching myself C++ about 10 years ago by writing a build system. Don't learn how to program by writing a build system. <laughs> if you have a friend that is like, I'm thinking of writing a build system, Tell them not to. Care about your friends and the people around you. Um, I've been paying attention to Rust for a while. Uh, Steve kind of made, made mention of 0 0.5 and uh, the kind of the syntax of, you know, the, the old tilde t, um, back when tilde t and at t were still a thing. This was before the borrow checker and uh, when I, I think everything was still either like uh, equivalent to a unique pointer or a shared pointer in the C++ side. Um, and iterators were still more Ruby-like. So the, the current stream iterator implementation um, that has been used since, uh, you know, forever, uh, wasn't really a thing. Um, so that's my Twitter, um, that's my GitHub. Um, it, yes, it is Slurps Mad Rips. Um, I can go into the story of why I chose that username in 2012, but let's not right now. Um, and I also just want to set up some, some boundaries real quick, so, um, you know, any questions, uh, let, let's wait until after the talk. Um, if we don't have time for questions, you can speak to me in person outside. I won't actually sit off to the side here. I'll actually physically walk out just so that we can give more people space up here uh, for the next talk. And uh, lastly, you can always tweet a question to me with that hashtag, 123 got a CPP. Um, I, and, and I actually check this hashtag every couple of, every couple of weeks. Um, because uh, you know, maybe you're watching this at home, maybe you had a question that you wanted to ask me, forgot about it, then remembered it on the way home um, after the conference. Um, this allows you to ask that question. I will respond to it. You can also at me, uh, but by using this hashtag, other people can also see what questions you yourselves have asked. Um, so uh, a couple extra talks that um, uh, I suggest all of you go and watch at some point after this conference and after this talk, so you can kind of get a better idea. Um, we only have 30 minutes, obviously. Um, there's the Elsewhere Memory Talk by Neil Douglas. I'm from ACCU 2019. Uh, Jen Schiffer's uh, talk on JavaScript considered useful. And then um, The Tragedy of Systemd uh, by Ben O'Rice. Uh, I'm pretty sure I just murdered his first name there. But um, uh, these, these three talks um, I've been watching pretty, pretty regularly because they, they cover a wide variety of di different things, uh, from the C++ abstract machine to uh, community-related things as well as even standardization in the case of Jen's talk. And um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about each of the things that, is, that are in these talks, but in reference to C++ and Rust today. Um, so as I said, uh, you know, why are we here? Um, so I think they're gonna be, uh, C++ and Rust are gonna be living side by side um, for quite a long time, if only because uh, contracts with, uh, you know, various industries exist. Um, there are people that are still writing C code until 2050 um, on military hardware. So if C is going to live that long, C++ will definitely live as long because currently the C standards uh, committee charter says um, that uh, they are to keep basically in lockstep with C++ and to make sure that C stays compatible with C++ rather than what used to be the other way around. Um, Rust also is not going anywhere. I think it is, has too much momentum at this point. It is technically a 13-year-old language. Um, so, you know, it's, it's old enough to curse at me and tell me I'm bad at Counter-Strike online. <laughs> 
Um, C++ is kind of like the 40-year-old burned out person that used to play Quake in 1993 or whatever. <laughs> um, so, you know, neither of us are going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and we might as well work together to learn from each other's mistakes. There's a lot of stuff involved with tooling, with optimizations that we can learn from. Um, and, uh, you know, while be honest, used to create C++ might say, oh, other languages are copying C++. Um, there are people on the standards committee for C++ that are looking at what Rust does for optimizations, uh, for language features, and we are borrowing from them. I've submitted quite a few papers in, in regarding that. So just to give you an idea of like how similar the languages are, um, we've got a, a, you know, a lot of stuff um, that is similar, but our terminology is starting to drift, kind of like you know, how um, you know, the Romance language is drifted, and if you speak Spanish, you can kind of understand Italian, and if you speak Italian, you can kind of understand Spanish. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, and we're both kind of trapped trying to express high-level concepts uh, for machine code. And um, Rust doesn't have an abstract machine, C++ does, and our abstract machine is basically the PDP-11. Um, <laughs> and if something can't meet that, then it's not really an abstract machine. It's kind of a shame. Um, but Rust does have to meet a lot of the stuff that C++ does because um, by using LLVM, you're stuck with our um, memory model. Um, and if in the future NVIDIA says, we'll, we'll adopt the Rust memory model over C++, then we'll have to follow uh, you know, your direction of things, but I don't think that's gonna be happening anytime soon, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, so here's some code differences here. So, you know, Rust has let, we have auto. I didn't put auto const because um, you don't want an auto const R value reference, and that's, let's not, you know what? Let's just not get into that part <laughs> of the language. It's a kind of a landmine. Um, Rust has the turbo fish. We have both um, uh, the, uh, I apologize, I use Fura code, so that's why it looks like a diamond there. Um, uh, as well as the uh, scope template syntax. Uh, the, the form of that we use less nowadays. Um, we're relaxing type name and its usage and it's making writing generic code easier. It also means that this kind of uh, you know, scope template thing is disappearing. Um, the if let sum or if let you know, some value uh, expression uh, is kind of equivalent to if auto x equals some uh, Boolean expression. Uh, and um, moving into more um, uh, literals uh, in C++ 20, we still have to write <laughs> using this stupid macro from C, uh, C std int, uh, int 64 underscore C to get an actual int 64 T, um, whereas uh, in 23, due to the paper I'm writing, um, we, can, we will actually be able to write the same thing that Rust has. Um, and that is actually a library feature, not a language feature, because um, we're so cursed. We said, hey, what if anyone could just write whatever suffix literal they wanted for a given uh, built-in type? And someone said, yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> um, our our uh, integer separators are a bit different. Uh, Rust has borrowed from a, a variety of other languages, Python, Ruby, um, I think Perl maybe. Um, but a lot of people are moving in this direction of you know, using the underscores as a uh, digit separator. Um, we chose the single quote in C++ because it kind of mimics this, the uh, choice of uh, a period or a comma without us having to get into localization issues. Um, I personally believe that the C++ one is a little better, and um, I've also seen people writing uh, integers out in actual like papers using the C++ syntax. Um, instead of the underscored version. I think uh, in, in academic papers, you'll see the C++ form more, even if the paper has nothing to do with C++. Um, both C++ and Rust can overload some operators. I found out <laughs> last night that you can over, <laughs> overload the not operator in Rust, and we can also do that in C++. So, hey, we both have a really bad decision. That's great. <laughs> um, Rust moves are equivalent to a new concept that we're trying to try out in C++, which is called relocation. Um, our moves are kind of just a tag on the type system. So when you have an R value reference and you've moved something into a function, that does not mean that the data has been moved from, whereas in Rust, moving from something implies destruction. Um, uh, relocation might be uh, an optimization that comes in the future. We're still trying to even figure out the basic semantics of it. Uh, it's going to be a long road. We probably won't see it in actual practice until 26 or 29. Um, Rust has working groups. We have study groups. They're both kind of the same. Anyone can participate in a study group in C++. Anyone can participate in a working group. Um, you still have to you know, approach both with uh, good faith arguments. Um, and that's a 
like I said, we don't have enough, we don't have enough time for this, unfortunately, so apologies. Um, so also, technically speaking, this code that you see here, this could be valid C++ or REST code. Um, those of you that are familiar with C++ might have figured out already what I'm doing here, which is you just sharp define uh, let to auto, and you're on your way. Um, I already discussed the, the memory model stuff, um, and uh, Neil's talk about the abstract machine is very interesting. So it's actually about two hours. Um, but it is uh, extremely interesting talk because it kind of gives you an idea of where the hardware that we currently use today comes from, where it's going to, and the limitations that we have to deal with. Because you know you could have a high-level language that could do everything, but if um, you know the CPU is going to be flipping bits behind your back and you don't know about it, that's going to cause problems for you. Um, of course, we also have our differences. We're not going to talk about defaults. Okay, I, we already know about it. It's like a dead meme, right? Like rewrite it in Rust. Dead meme, talking about const as default and mutability, also a dead meme. I don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about lifetime semantics. We're going to talk about concepts and traits because they're very similar but very different. Um, this is just what I'm calling this right now, the execution context boundary. This isn't a thing that we have a term for in either community yet. Um, but it is something that's going to be coming up because of changes in C20. So Rust lifetime semantics, as I'm sure you're all aware, it's baked into the language. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a, a uh, you know a lifetime you know syntax to represent it. Um, most of the time, this this concept of lifetime ownership and stuff like that can be mapped to existing APIs from foreign languages. So C, um, if you're trying to call into C++ in some way, and you figured out how to generate the correct symbol for it, sure, even there. Um, and custom semantics do break down, though, when you get into stuff like Objective-C or OpenCL. And yes, from an optimization uh, perspective, you do not want to always be retaining and releasing these. But at the same time, sometimes it's nice to just take someone's really garbage Objective-C code and then to just copy it into your own code and not have to change as much. Um, C++ lifetime semantics, um, we don't have any. <laughs> we, we literally do not. Everything involving unique pointer, shared pointer, um, all of this stuff has, uh, is defined by the library portion of the standard. So the, the language doesn't have a concept of a unique pointer of um, ownership and releasing ownership uh, of, of um, you know, incremental counts and dereference counts and all that other stuff, or I'm sorry, decrementing counts. <laughs> um, but so as I said, everything's library defined, mostly, obviously value semantics, destructors and stuff like that, those are at the language level. Um, both languages have this concept of DRES. I'm not going to use RAII because, one, it's a terrible, terrible acronym. It's impossible to pronounce, right? It sounds like a bread if you just say it out loud. Um, whereas DRES, you can make a joke about Tron and everyone's going to understand it, like immediately, right? Um, and yes, I know a drop does not imply a destructor. It could be a scope-based resource, but DRES just sounds cooler. Um, as an example, um, retain pointer. This is a type I've been working on. So uh, retain pointer, I first wrote it, uh, the proposal for it in a night in 2016, um, because this is a, a type that is meant to you know, work with C APIs, like you know, OpenCL or Objective-C, because Objective-C is a C runtime. Um, it's meant to work with you know, COM and DirectX and uh, some parts of the, the Mono framework. Um, Web browsers have implementations of retain pointer inside of them. Um, uh, Safari specifically inside of the WebKit tool framework, which is namespaced as WTF, has a type called retain pointer, as it turns out. I did not know this when I wrote the paper. Um, and then also it's useful for implementing async APIs. Basically, std future, um, std shared pointer, std weak pointer, std exception pointer, and um, std retain pointer itself, all of these can be implemented with retain pointer. Uh, on the Rust side, if you had an equivalent to retain pointer, you would be able to implement both RC and ARC um, in terms of a retain pointer. So this is a very low level type. Um, and it introduces this concept of adoption, right? We have, we have the concept of extending the lifetime of a type. We have the concept of ownership of a type. But we do not have a concept of a, a value has come in from some boundary that we do not know where it might come from exactly. We just know that it has come in from a function. And we want to be able to use that type for a brief period and eventually kick it out of our house. So kind of like adoption, but not maybe not the best term in that case, I guess. So, um, <laughs> so um, uh, this, this type is 
Um, there's a, someone on Twitter whose name is uh, Arvid Gersman. He is uh, a bit of a firebrand in, in that he disagrees with everything the C++ community does and says, this is just overcomplicated. I don't care about this, so neither should you. Um, but after I presented this, uh, this subtitled version of Retain Pointer in 2018 last year, he came up to me and said, I've implemented this six times in my code base. I'm replacing it with this. And if Arvid says this is a good idea for the C++ standard library to have, then maybe you're onto something. Um, so let's talk about traits versus concepts real quick. So Rust traits are maximally constrained, right? If, if, if a type does not mention what traits it uses, you can't call any member functions on that, right? Whereas in C++, they're minimally constraining. C++ says this type has to meet the basics of this interface, but other than that, go hog wild. I don't care if this function doesn't exist. If I have to do a lookup later, you might get an error there. And so more work has to go into a concept to make sure that the minimum interface is being met. Um, and we're gonna um, also discuss briefly, so they are now, I had to add this literally five minutes ago, um, special members, which are constructors, destructors, copy constructors, assignment, um, are now follow the best fit model as of Cologne, which was back in June. And as an example here, here's a uh, const expert optional implementation where um, the destructor um, that is trivially defaulted there um, will be used if the given T, which is destructible, is also trivially destructible. If it is not, then we have to reset the optional on destruction. Does that, does that make sense? Like, I know this is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful, but the semantics for this are basically why we did this, because we can use this on member functions as well in C++. Um, so let's look at using a concept. So this is, this is some garbage code here, and I apologize, but this is just the best way I was able to implement this. And this is basically to say, if a type has an element type def, or if it has a pointer type def, I want to get that out of it and use that as a storage value. And so this is a slightly regular type because um, unfortunately uh, we have the concept of a regular and semi-regular type, but for that to be true, something has to be copyable, not only movable as a minimum. Um, we also uh, decided at Cologne to change all of these names to uh, snake case instead of the uppercase form, and I didn't feel like rewriting any of this code, so you're just gonna have to deal with it. Um, so here's a pointer-like type. This is for our smart pointer interfaces, right? So you can get it, you can cast it to a bool explicitly, you can reset it, you can reset it with an instance of the pointer type internally, hence the pointer type of T, which we saw two slides up. Um, we're not gonna get into this explicitly here, but you'll also notice um, on this line right here, um, <laughs> we're checking to see if you can call the arrow operator directly as a member function rather than calling the arrow because that's a thing we can also do in C++. Isn't that a nightmare? Um, but here's, here's a handle, right? This handle can implement any kind of ownership model as long as that ownership is defined by this pointer-like storage type. And as an example here, we can have a unique handle, we can have a shared handle, we can have a retained handle, and we can also have a viewed handle. And you wouldn't hold this as a member inside of your class, you would actually inherit from this in C++. This is basically a mix-in type. And as an example, if we use the uh, Android NDK as an example here, here, we have a simple enum class with an orientation, and here's a configuration type. Now there's a lot of code here, the important part here is that we just inherit from it. And in our constructor, we, uh, that is copying. We have to call this a configuration copy thing. Use this other thing called uh, out pointer. Let's not get into that part. That's not what matters. What matters though is you'll notice this class does a whole bunch of stuff. You can reset with it. You can cast it to a boolean. You can check to see if it is a valid configuration or not. That is, I think, really powerful in C++ is that we do have the ability to have mix-ins um, that also then uh, expand the lifetime semantics of whatever it is trying to make excuse me, to manage. So, and in seven slides, we described uh, a per type opt-in for lifetime semantics. You can have a non-owning handle, you can have a retained handle, a shared handle, or a unique handle. Um, and that's just with concepts. Implementing that without concepts, absolutely a nightmare. And there's a whole bunch of side effects that I don't wanna get into. Um, but I think that's a very powerful part of C++ here. Um, we can also extend this by implementing other pointer-like types. So uh, hazard pointer, which is meant more for um, concurrency-related stuff. 
uh, boost offset pointer, which is a, uh, an optimization for shared memory operations. Um, and even if you wanted to have some weird pointer into like Go, and you were binding code with CGO, you would be able to use this as well. Um, the execution context boundary is uh, basically this idea of executing code at compile time versus runtime. Um, I believe uh, Ollie was discussing this in, in uh, their talk. I missed that talk because I was trying to finish up a few slides. I apologize for that. Um, but const generics versus const expert and const eval is basically where we're getting into this. Uh, C++ has explored this in a lot more areas. Um, our compilers are trying to implement bytecode interpreters for const expert um, just for speed purposes. Um, so in C++20, we're getting const eval, const init, and we still have const expert. Um, we're not going to talk about const init. It is a terrible keyword with one specific use. A lot of people don't understand its meaning. I am one of those people, so I can't explain it even if I wanted to. Um, functions are runtime by default, as they are in Rust. Const eval means it can only execute at compile time and in a compile time context. So if you try to you know, return a function from main, the function will still execute at compile time, but then the value that is returned will be stored and then returned in a runtime context. Const expert is sometimes at compile time, and this is where the bridge, uh, co uh, concept of a bridge between these two uh, boundaries for uh, execution context comes in. Um, we can now detect in C++20 if we are running underneath a const expert um, context or not, and then change our code dependent on that. In C++20, we will be able to have const expert simd semantics because at, const, uh, you know, at compile time, we just do what it would normally do in a non-efficient way, and at compile time, we can actually insert uh, assembly instructions, right? Um, I think that that's extremely powerful um, and allows you to... Um, also check to see like, okay, because a const expert function cannot invoke undefined behavior, you can kind of check your stuff with a static assert at compile time and allow the, you know, uh, the, the type system to kick into place. Um, we also support virtual const expert, which yes, this is terrifying, um, because if you think about it, it means that you can have a virtual const expert destructor. So we can have compile time polymorphism in the 1990s style way of inheritance and virtual functions and public inheritance. And yes, this also supports virtual base classes. So if you remember that massive slide that everyone just like gasped in horror at the closing keynote last year that had a million virtual <laughs> base classes, um, that could technically be done at compile time as well. <laughs> um, that said though, if we can do any of this, I think Rust can do it too. Um, I, again, I, not that part specifically I should note. <laughs> But just the ability to have like a, a dyne trait be compile time, I think, is something that could potentially be in Rust's future. It wouldn't obviously be a, uh, a dyne trait. It would probably be a const dyne trait. But that is something I think is definitely possible. Um, maybe not right now. I'm not going to write the proposal. I have too many things going on in my life right now. I have 17 papers I need to get through the C++ <laughs> standard. <laughs> So um, we're going to talk about something here. Uh, we're going to be switching gears, right? The, the technical part of this talk is over with. And this is, um, we're going to be leading into this very slowly. It's just let it build up. I promise we'll be over with it soon. Um, so in Ben O'Rice's talk, he mentions that the FreeBSD community was telling those unhappy with SystemD to come to FreeBSD, right? And this is a problem because SystemD's uh, creator, even if he is an abrasive person, even if you don't like him, I don't think he deserves death threats. And if these are the same people that are then going into the FreeBSD community, that is a problem. And um, those are not the people you want in a community, right? You don't want to find out that, oh, this speaker at a conference sent a death threat to someone that uh, maintains a C++ compiler and also now they're running Rust. Um, kind of like this sort of thing that happened here. Um, saying that uh, the people in charge of C++ are idiots and that it is academic masturbation is not gonna win any points with anyone. And furthermore, saying, oh, we should try to get game developers to come to Rust is one, gonna make everyone here have an aneurysm when you have to see all the unsafe code they're gonna write, because they're gonna use the unsafe keyword, trust me. I've already seen some of the code that's out there. And also, you don't want this kind of person to be talking to people in general, right? Like. <laughs> Do you, do you want to have a conversation where this is like, oh, this is a tweet from a dude that has written a book on physics in C++ and using it over the network. 
and, and he lost his absolute mind at me. Um, I also wanted to show a few tweets from the VP of technology at Activision. Um, but he blocked me on Twitter when I said the game companies that make billions of dollars should maybe pay their uh, employees a valid salary and maybe they could just send representatives to C++ if they're that upset about it. So, you know. Um, I, and also, I don't, I don't think you want people like this in your milieu, right, in your general social environment. Um, and uh, if we start to see other implementations arise, you may not have a choice but to interact with them. Right? Just because the Rust community right now has a code of conduct, and just because the Rust subreddit has a code of conduct does not mean that an alternative implementation of Rust has to follow those same code of conduct rules. And that kind of brings us into the concept of standard versus specifications. So all standards are a specification, but not all specifications are a standard, especially if they only apply to a single product. Right? If there was a specification for the Rust compiler, that would just be a specification for what the Rust compiler can and cannot do. It does not imply that if I write my own Rust compiler, that I have to implement every part of said specification. Thus, there could be a standard Rust in the future where bar CK is not a part of that. Right? And that's one of the most powerful parts of the Rust compiler, but it is not part of the language. The borrow checker is just a static analysis tool. It is not baked into the language itself. And yeah, that's terrifying, but we're gonna put that aside for now, okay? We're not gonna actually bring this up again. So in C++, we're limited to the rules of ISO. ISO actually has this hard rule of five years is the, is the minimum amount of time, that, or the maximum amount of time um, you are allowed to uh, release a standard between. So the fact that we're doing it every three years in C++, we're kind of breaking the rules. Um, and Rust is limited to the laws of the United States under which Mozilla operates, right? If they say, you cannot provide software to someone in Iran, right, then all of Iran cannot use Rust. I could technically hand a USB drive to someone from Germany, and then that person could hand it to someone from Iran, but I can't know about that at all. This is where things start to get like really hairy in general. Um, ISO draws its authority from multiple nations, each backed by treaties, international trademark laws. In some cases, they use their military to enforce these laws and by owning the content found in this document. So C++, the, the working group 21, C++ standards committee, we don't own the C++ standard. The ISO uh, you know, organization owns it. ISO organization, ATM machine. Um, so it's... <laughs> So there's this concept of a standard plate of spaghetti, right? A plate of spaghetti against which you could technically judge all other you know, uh, plates of spaghetti. And if something doesn't meet that standard plate of spaghetti, it can be deemed subpar. So there is, in fact, a, a minimum amount of you know, cooked spaghetti that you can meet. And ISO owns the copyright and trademark for said document. Um, membership access to ISO, by the way, changes per country. In the United States, it's $2,200 a year. Um, and you can also get some of that money dis uh, to, made to disappear, or the, the requirement to disappear, if you make less than $3 million. Um, as a result, the United States national body for ISO is massive. We have tons of companies that are not based in the United States because it's just easier to join the US one than it is to join their own countries. Uh, ECMA is an alternative organization to ISO and draws its authority from the same sources, except that it's based out of Switzerland. Um, but corporations have as much of a say there as a national body. If Google pays $17,000 and INCITS, the American Standards Body, uh, pays $17,000, they have an equal say. It's also prohibitively expensive. I think the, the minimum amount of money you need to pay per year for voting rights is 17,000 uh, Swiss marks or whatever their currency is. I don't care anymore. Um, I don't pay attention to that stuff. So. <laughs> Um, Mozilla draws its authority from United States corporate laws, such as intellectual property laws that can be used to threaten permanent destitution to anyone violating them if a court seen, uh, deems that someone has violated these laws, right? If a judge says, yes, you are in violation of this intellectual property, and as a result, I'm going to fine you $500 a day until you decide to come in line with these rules, that can seriously limit your future and, and um, Currently, uh, Chelsea Manning is, I believe, paying $1,000 a day for refusing to testify in front of a grand jury. Um, she could use some help financially, by the way. Um, and in the above cases, a person does not have the power to say something, 
right? Without some labor-derived reason, right? So if something isn't for work, then uh, changes to C++ or Rust um, might be dismissed, right? If I'm not doing it for a project, then you can just ignore my changes. Um, this takes power away from users and replaces it with submission to authority. Also, I'm sorry, I'm getting the note that I need to speed up here um, and basically wrap up. So I'm gonna, just gonna skip ahead here. And um, the, the thing I'm trying to get at here, I guess, is that um, can get to a lot of this stuff. I tried so hard, got so far to the end, didn't even matter. Um, <laughs> so I guess the thing I'm trying to say is that I don't want Rust to standardize. I think that um, trying to force it into an organization that has to be backed by a nation state to enforce it is a mistake. And uh, what Rust really needs is some kind of informal body um, to, uh, well, also, by the way, I'm an anarchist, I don't have all the answers, and apparently neither do I have the time to finish this up, so we're just gonna, <laughs> yeah. So, so a, an informal body for a formal standard does not exist. I don't know if it could exist and how you would even enforce any of these things. It's very difficult to talk about this stuff, and this is something that I would rather have had a lot more time to get to this point. Maybe I should have pushed it further up in the, in the talk. Um, and, uh, you know, you all have a responsibility yourselves and your communities, but also to the industries we work in. Um, and uh, I guess I'm just gonna close this, this talk up with this. Um, you know, if, if you wanna hide horrors and fight to prevent major catastrophe and unite humanity so we don't have to feel pain or be alone, that's not language evangelism, that's language evangelionism. <laughs> and I'm sorry that this talk ended up going over the time here. Uh, I guess we're out of time, yeah. So um, I, I will be putting these slides up on GitHub, so uh, feel free to check that out later. And um, if you want to actually have the important part of the talk that I wanted to get to, which is please don't make a standard that has to close off access to the current milieu that is in this room, that is at this conference, that is at other conferences, um, and requires people to pay to, to vote. Um, I highly suggest that you you look into alternatives, even if they don't exist yet, even if you have to make something new. Thank you.